As a teenager, I moved from my home state, Michigan, to Alaska and experienced countless adventures in some of the most wild and scenic landscapes created by God. and became an expert outdoorsman. I also had many close calls. The closest brush with death on the luckiest day of my life when I narrowly escaped an attack from a Kodiak grizzly bear, the largest carnivore on earth. I'm telling you, we just got attacked. This thing would have destroyed us. Look at the claws. Amazing. This is unbelievable. I am also an entrepreneur and created outdoor adventure businesses on two continents. Custom made experiences to fulfill the lifelong dreams of scores of clients. The first being Alaskan Quest. Then repeated my business success across the globe in New Zealand. It allowed clients from all over the world to experience a breathtaking country full of scenic beauty and culture. Because of a secret I had innocently discovered years earlier on an Alaskan wilderness rafting trip, everything in my life was about to change. I had made some powerful enemies. My home was raided in the U.S. by federal agents and in New Zealand by government officials. I was chased around the world by a U.S. special agent. I was jailed in a foreign country. In the U.S. I faced nine felonies, 45 years in prison, and over two million in fines, and seven years and a hundred thousand in New Zealand. My wife returned to the U.S. I had no advocates. I felt abandoned and was exhausted from fighting all the corrupt government bureaucrats from both countries. When all hope seemed gone, I climbed to the top of a hillside, fell to my knees, and reconnected with God. Then the miracles happened. story that I had to tell. I'm not like one of these guys who was a, a writer by nature, so it's almost like a small miracle that I even wrote a book. So I just wanted to let you know that it sort of makes me laugh that I am an author, but uh, it did come out good. I spent two years of my life uh, writing that book and uh, has been picked up and doing pretty good. But basically the book is a story that I had to share uh, just from everything I went through and basically it gives God all the glory. Uh, in the end for getting me here today and to share that I feel very grateful there's no doubt but anyway as a child I was born in Niles Michigan and uh, I always dreamed uh, of the outdoors and doing things of that kind especially Alaska I remember I would sit in a junior high school and I'd go into the library and get every fur fishing game magazine that they had and I would read that and, and just read all these beautiful places especially Alaska and uh, I just got a lucky break and uh, my mother met a gentleman when I was like 12 years old and he happened to move to Fairbanks. So the next thing you know, my mother remarried and moved to Fairbanks and then here I got a, an in and the dreams that I had been dreaming are reality to me now. So I got to go to Alaska and that just started my lifestyle out uh, to where you see some of the things in that video 
uh, I was lucky enough to excel at the outdoors and I created that business called Alaskan Quest and that thing is uh, just my love and in the life that I live. I take people all over on custom trips. I do fishing trips to watching grizzly bears, to gold panning, you name it in Alaska. I've been up there my whole life and I cover every inch of that ground. I just go on adventures nonstop. So people call me, they want to go do unique stuff in Alaska. I probably am a pretty good guy to go with because I know it pretty well and I'm just going to take you out there and we're going to do anything you want to do. But that was the business that I created there. And uh, it was a dream job for me, and I just got lucky enough. And I tell you what, I wake up every morning, and I don't take anything for granted. I just am very thankful to have that. Now, years ago, you wouldn't hear a nice, soft, kind guy like me talking this. I mean, I would have probably been a lot different character. And that's a good thing with this book, is everything I went through, as you'll find out here soon, is sort of God's plan for me, uh, the reconnection part, because uh, it really is such a fantastic thing to have a relationship with God. And I'll get into that here soon. But um, a lot of my troubles here that you saw on here started one day. I was doing a wild wilderness float trip in Alaska where you use bush planes. I use them a lot up there. I'm floating down a river doing a moose hunt and at 200 miles from any, any town, any road. And I uh, happened to come across the first time on this river, I see an old trapper's cabin. And it's got nothing but sod on the roof, 150 years old. It intrigued me. And I thought, hey, I'd like to pull up in there and check that out. I mean, what kind of individual would have been able to build a cabin like that in the middle of nowhere 150 years ago and, and lived here and made a livelihood out of it. This was really interesting to me. Very rugged person, I thought, just quite unique. But as I pulled up there, I looked behind there about 20 yards and there's an outhouse, which is, was very nice. When you're out in the woods for four to five days, hey, that's uh, like a huge luxury. And even better, I went in there and I'm looking around. I'm, I'm feeling like, hey, I'm sort of a rough Indian. You know, I love being out in the wilderness. I'm rugged and this and that. And I looked beside me and there's baby wipes in there. I thought, now this is very odd. In the middle of the wilderness and there's baby wipes here. I said, what kind of individual, what kind of man uses that? But I tell you what, after five, six days out there, I tried those baby wipes and I tell you what, maybe now I am the biggest sissy in Alaska because I just love them and there's no better. And I even if upgraded, I use face wipes too out there now. So I'll tell you what, uh, that is a good thing to have. And that's one thing I learned on that day. But Following that day, right there, I looked even behind there, and they were building a giant mansion in the middle of nowhere, and I come to find out, as I'm there looking around, planes are coming in, and life is timing, so it was all bad timing for me that day, because a judge pulled up in there who owned it, and a doctor, basically the judge never came till real later, but the doctor pulled up, and just being a nice guy, I helped him unload the plane, and he's telling me, be careful with these cases, and I'm thinking, oh, no problem. And he says, those are $200 bottles of scotch in there, in a lot of cases, four-wheelers and everything, piece by piece. So these people are well plugged in, and they're doing things out there, apparently, that they didn't want me to know, because it went really well for a while, and then all of a sudden he turned, got really, really nasty. He wanted me out of the area, and he basically said, I'm flying at you out of here now. So we had words, in a way, uh, and I'm not saying, it was probably some pretty rough words, but I won't get into that. But anyway, we didn't have a very good friendship to start. And he told me we have ways of getting you out of here and keeping you out of here. I said, okay, whatever. So I'm gone. So basically the next time I come through there, uh, he had a special agent I didn't know at the time. I found out years later uh, waiting there for me, which started a lot of havoc in my life, as you saw by that. And I, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But I, I went about my life not knowing all this stuff, doing all my adventures and stuff. And, uh, you know, one time I went on a hunt, and I'm going to share this. This was the bear attack that I went through. So basically, uh, I'm a very lucky man to be here today by the grace of God. I should have died that day, and I'll share that with you a little bit. But uh, it was on Kodiak Island, and I just uh, finished a hunt with a buddy, and he's not here tonight, so I can really elaborate a little bit and tell you a little bit more about it, which makes me laugh, because uh, I'll tell you some things about him. But his name was John, and we just got off a huge moose hunting trip in Alaska, and he'd shot a huge moose, first time he'd ever been to Alaska. So he's all full of himself, and... Uh, he is just saying, hey, you know, I, I am now the baddest thing in the woods, he tells me. Because he made a 400-yard shot on a big moose, so he's feeling real good about himself. He says, hey, uh, you keep sending me pictures of these giant black-tailed deer on Kodiak Island. He says, I want to go. Can you make it happen? You know, I just got back from Alaska, and I was selling mounted wolverines, out, you know, building this little business up, and I said, I can make it happen. So I called up, made the arrangement. So next thing you know, we're on a plane flying up there. And uh, just out of the blue, just happened like that. And, you know, he says on the plane, you know, I always wanted to get a grizzly bear. 
and uh, he says, uh, man, if one attacks us, you know, and, and rips my shirt or this and that, I'm going to shoot it and I'll have my bare skin rubbed. And I says, John, man, come on. Now. There's nothing that you don't want in your life is to go through something like that. And uh, he kept joking and saying, you know, I am the baddest thing in the woods. I, I might get that bear. And I just blew it off. So anyway, there's moral of this story is basically, in a way, be careful what you wish for because we got up there and we went out. I haven't seen any bear tracks at all. This is Kodiak Island, mind you, the biggest carnivores in the world. They're, some of them are over 12 foot long. Some of them weigh, they say, up to 1,500 pounds. I mean, they're huge. And I haven't been seeing any tracks at all. A little bit of light snow, no bear scat, no nothing. So I'm thinking these bears are hibernating. Now you gotta remember, I, I hang out in Alaska a lot, so I always have a gun on me, and I don't let my guard down much, especially with these bears. I've had a lot of bear encounters up there. So I, I'm getting a little relaxed, which is probably a huge mistake. And uh, anyway, we shot some huge trophy black-tailed deer. And what we would do is I would skin them out, and I would tie them to John's back. Of course, we're gonna take them back home and get them mounted, and I would put the meat in the backpack. And these are just trophy animals. What I did was I had a, you had to fly into a lodge on Larson Bay in the middle of Kodiak Island. And I'd take a, a boat and they'd drop me off 50 miles away, come get me in the end of the day at dark. So we'd hung all day long. So I had him all tied up with two giant trophies. I had the meat getting packed in my backpack. And then we had a couple, about a mile and a half to walk down to the, the beach there and I meet the boat. And it's a, it's a, hilly and it goes up and down all the way down but anyway you're going to see the miracles that day that worked in my life i just share them really fast but anyway we just got done and i never keep my guns from me but i had my guns about from here to that screen only place to lean them up on when i did the butchering so you'll see in a second as i tell you i started to get my guns and just walked off couldn't get them up on my my shoulder because the backpack john took off about to where those girls are over there uh sitting on the table there they are and he's walking and it's windy, so you can't really hear, hear a lot. And he's going like downhill. Just a little bit of snow. So I just grabbed my guns from there and I turned around and I'm walking. And all of a sudden I hear a giant roar. I'm like, what, what is that? Because it's windy. And I look over here, right where I've got my guns, this bear with a giant head that you saw pictures of in there. He come crashing through there. And I'm thinking, well, right there I just want to stop. That was the first miracle. Had he had came through there 30 seconds earlier, my guns were there. I would have never been able to get my guns. I mean, he had me dead to rights. So anyway, I'm walking, and there he is, and his head's out, and he's mad. One of the nastiest bears I've ever seen. And right away, he's snapping his teeth. And when they snap their teeth, that means to me, in American language, I'm going to kick your rear end, and it's not good. Whenever they're snapping their teeth and growling, their ears are back. I mean, that's a mad bear, and he needs business. And I thought, oh, no, I'm in trouble now. So I'm backing up his natural instincts. And uh, I'm yelling at him, hey, 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 because you want to let him know that you're a man. And I just thought that might be Tory because, you know, it catches you off guard. So uh, I'm backing up, and now here he comes busting running at me. And I'm thinking, oh, no. I said, I know I only got one chance, basically. I'm going to stick the gun up. Hopefully he'll bite it, and I'll pull the trigger, and boom, shoot him. Because if I try to shoot him running at me, I'm never going to get another shot. So they say they can outrun racehorses in a quarter mile, and, and I believe it. So anyway, I'm backing up, and I'm screaming. And I'll tell you what, at this time in your life, you're going to know what kind of man you are. I'm going to tell you right now, it's all on the line. You're going to know exactly what kind of man you are. So I'm backing up, and uh, all, all of a sudden I slip. Now here's another miracle. I didn't plan on slipping, believe me. I slip, and I go right down on my rear end, and my torso's up, and I'm bracing the gun for him to hit it, and I'm pulling the trigger. That's, that's what I'm doing. And I still was yelling at a, at a big uh, manly voice, hey, 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 I'm a man the whole time. And so I'm sort of proud of myself, you know. I can't make that up. So I back up, and here this bear comes at me, and in a, another miracle, in a split second, he sees John about from here to those gals. John's standing up and has a, a big old black coat on and stuff, and he leaves me. I mean, he went from this far from my gun that fast to go to John and left me. So I, why? I don't know. All I can tell you is my thoughts is I thought this, these bears, he didn't take me as a threat then. He took John, who looked bigger, as the threat and left me, or an active guy. Who, who knows? So anyway, he goes to John, and now John come with me, and I'm supposed to be like the overseer of him, and his wife told me the last thing on the phone, take care of him. Didn't want John to hear that, but take care of John, you know, and here John has been telling me he's the baddest thing in the woods, right? Now he wants to get, you know, a bearskin rug, and blot, and you know, if he carries his jacket, he's going to get it, and he's talking tough. Okay, the bear's shooting at him. All I see is a rear end, like three giant trash cans, and he's going so fast, there's dirt flying. The only thing I thought of, oh no, John's a dead man. What am I going to tell his wife? That, that's what I thought. But, oh, this is crazy. 
So he's going at John. John now turns around and sees the bear, right? Well, the baddest thing in the woods, I tell you right now, he wasn't a bad. He made noises that was not of a man. I, I never heard such blood curling woman scream, and I never will hear that again, I'm sure. But the baddest thing in the woods now is screaming, and, and, and these are women screams. I mean, really, really loud. And I thought again, right then, I said, uh, he's screaming like that. You know, that's like a, enhancing a predator. When they hear like a predator squealing going on, they just go nuts. And I said, oh, no. And so it's going right at him. Now, here's another miracle. John is screaming, and he's backing up, and John is like on a hill with a little ice on it. The bear goes at John, and what they do, uh, if you've ever been around bears, I have a lot, they like to hit you with their force and throw you up, and then they maul you after you hit the ground. And that's what they like to do. So this bear lunged in the air to get John. John is screaming, but natural one thing, I'll say he's backing up like I did. John, another miracle, slips like I did, but instead of going on his torso, he goes down like a board, just flat down. The bear's in the air. The bear actually goes over John, tears his jacket, believe it or not. <laughs> Tears his jacket. John puts his gun up. The bear bites the gun. And I can see like the bear is thinking, what is this, you know? Because, it, it, you know, it was like John was no ninja guy or anything like that. He just <laughs> fell. So uh, the bear goes over him, does like a 180, and, he's, and it's downhill, and he's scratching like that, you know, to stop himself. And I'm thinking right now, hey, we have, it. We have a chance. And I'm still in my mind, my crazy mind, thinking, you know, I don't want to kill a bear. I want to deter this. I just want it all to stop. So I, I'm walking up to John now, and John's still laying on the ground. And the bear is regrouping and getting ready to get John because John is from me to the camera from the bear. And now I've closed the gap. Uh, I don't know, I'm coming in pretty fast now. And there you go, I'm proud of myself too. And most guys might have been taken off running over the hill, you know. And the poor John's there for himself. But hey, I'm coming in, and I'm thinking, well, we can do something. So the bear's coming at John. I got a scope on this gun, so I don't dare look through the scope in a way I'm still got some common sense because if John gets up, gets in my way, I'll shoot him. So I know the bear's going to get John. So I shoot off hand, still sort of trying to detour it. And boom, as the bear's coming at John, I shoot, hit him in the front, and throw dirt all over him. Which honestly was a good move because it actually stopped the bear. John got up, and I, I start screaming, John, shoot that bear, shoot that bear. Because now I know it's, there's, there's, it, the bear's just going crazy, growling, snarling, I mean, looking really nasty. So John gets up, he's about from here to that camera again, maybe a little closer, boom, the first shot, shoots the bear in the chest, and the bear just backs up and comes again. And I, I said, oh, I gotta shoot now. So boom, I shoot, hit him in the head, John shot, and I seen blood fly all over. Uh, the bear basically did a somersault. And I could tell right then, the look on the bear's face was, oh no, what did I get into? You know, he didn't, he didn't think that he's gonna lose this battle, he's gonna take everything. So he actually, I could see he was shocked that this had happened. So he's still crawling around trying to get away. I got one bullet now because, you know, I then shot twice. The bullets are my backpack. I can't get in there. You know, you got that kind of weight back there. You can't do nothing. I got one bullet. And I ain't going to let that go. I mean, I'm, I'm, John, how many bullets you got real fast? He said, I got a bunch. You know, he's got them all over. So I said, shoot that bear, man, until he stops moving. So I'm talking here to these little guys right here. Boom, boom, boom. He shot about five times. The bear's done. I think, oh man, what kind of stuff was that? So honestly, that was the luckiest day of my life, but it ain't over yet. I got a little time, I'm gonna tell you a little more. <laughs> and this is the craziest stuff. I took a camera, as you saw it on there, and I videoed a little bit of that, and I just got it on there. And then the way you hear me say, this doesn't feel right, so let's go. So anyway, we go over the hill, and if I would've stayed there, here come three more bears up, a giant sow and two three-year-old cubs charging up the hill from here to the door over there. And I'm like, oh my goodness, you gotta be kidding me. So I scream, hey, hey, hey. She stops, the cubs come closer. And they're pacing back and forth to see what she wants to do. She's as big as this boar right here. I mean, she's huge. So I, I scream at her, I says, hey, I'm gonna shoot you. I'm gonna shoot you. You know, and it's like she can almost understand what's going on. Now the baddest thing in the woods again, I'm not kidding you, grabs me by my shoulder. He says, I can't take any more of this. And he starts to faint. <laughs> and I'm like, you I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So I'm not kidding you. I, I smacked him, man. I said, pow, hit him right with my elbow and knocked him up. I, I, I split his mouth. I mean, I bloodied him up. And I said, now you get ready to shoot those cubs and I'm gonna shoot that sow, you know? When I shoot, get ready. So I, I told her I'm counting to three. And I started to count. And actually she turned around, walked away and growled all the way out and left. So we made it down to the boat. And uh, John is as white as the wall right there. The baddest thing in the woods. And uh, I, you know, I. I don't know, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm thinking, hey man, uh, we got a story to tell our grandkids and everything else. You know, it's gonna be 
Uh, hey, this is great. I'm going hunting tomorrow. I says, uh, you know, I, I know it's something to ask of you because you've been through a big ordeal, but I says, do you, you want to go in the morning? He says, I don't know. He says, I don't think my wife wants me to go. <laughs> so anyway, I laughed, and uh, he didn't call his wife. And anyway, the next day, I got to give him credit. He ended up going, uh, you know, deer hunting. We had a good time, but uh, we actually uh, kept it down to a minimum with the bears and stayed very clear of the dip thick brush and stuff. So that's the bear story. And again, I probably shouldn't be here. I mean, it was just a tremendous uh, day for me. And by the grace of God, I live. But um, anyway, after that, uh, I, I did some more things. One day I got pulled over by the special agent in, in, in Fairbanks. He questioned me, the doctors and the judge sicked him on me. And uh, next thing I know, they're raiding my house in Michigan here, uh, Kalamazoo. And uh, I've got... Uh, Federal agents, DNR officers, they're looking for all kinds of stuff in my house. I make it short, they took a little manila envelope away and, and didn't find nothing. Told me small potatoes, small fines, and I said, whatever you want, you know. And it, it got a little nastier than that, but I won't get into that. But uh, then I take off to New Zealand to do my second business that I, I do. Uh, built a, a nice hunting business up down there. It's a beautiful country. Uh, New Zealand is just gorgeous and you can see the lobsters and, the, and the, the beauty of the mountains and all that. If you ever get a chance, I just recommend go there. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great place to go. So after doing that, uh, not long, the special agent calls New Zealand and sets them on fire after me, and they come and raid my house there. And there's uh, seven cops, a couple detectives, and an immigration fraud officer. He trumped a whole bunch of charges up on me and sicked them on me, and of course they're going to believe a federal officer over a guy who's just down here doing a hunting business. So they come and get, excuse me, they come and get me and uh, put me in jail. And uh, on the way to jail, they were supposed to interview me. And a detective walking me over there says, hey, I've never seen nothing like this. He says, they just pulled three typed up charges against you. I've never seen anything like that. You didn't have a chance. But of course, they don't say that when they're on stand. You know, they, they tell you this walking you down to jail. So uh, I'm walking to jail. And so I find out now, uh, hey, I'm facing 52 years in prison. I'm facing 50, 52 years in prison and two million in fines by two countries. I'm thinking, this has just gotten crazy. I mean, hey, I, again, I'm not an angel. I know that, but I really did nothing too crooked or anything like that. It was over some uh, pre-typed up uh, resident tags, non-resident tags, but they made a huge ordeal over this just because, you know, I had people sick this guy on me. So you, and if you do want to hear the whole story on that, it's in that book. I, I did do that. But here, you know, I'm in New Zealand jail, a foreign jail. Now I'll tell you one thing, New Zealand is like a, basically a third world country. And you know, just imagine going back a hundred years in time is what some of that is like. And now you gotta imagine going into a jail like that. I'm an American, not well liked anyway. And now they, they're throwing me in a jail. So it, it's a pretty rough situation. And uh, I remember one just laying around there trying to, to gather everything going on. And of course I'm, I'm praying then and uh, I'm thinking what in the world have I, I gotten into? But this, it's a lot more serious than I'm leading on right here. And, uh, you know, I look over there in the evening time, dozing off, and this is how bad the place is. I look over and I said, hey, they, they got, uh, you know, drug sniffing dogs in here. And I'm, I'm like dozing off and I look up, and next thing I know, I said, hey, that, I've never seen a dog with a bare tail. And I look over a little closer and open my eyes, it's a rat. They got rats down there, almost as big as dogs. So I'm just telling you what kind of situation it is to be in these jails. But it's not, it wasn't good for me, and I didn't like it. And, I called the U.S. Embassy, they won't return my phone calls, I've got no advocates, I've got nobody standing up for me, you know, and, and I learned something there because I'm praying now, and you know, I'm laying it all out to God, and I did find out at that time, it was something that God wanted me to go through, and it's basically the moral of the story there is, God isn't going to let nobody save me, I look back now, he wasn't going to let nobody come and save me, because he didn't have me where he wanted me yet, you know, there was a little bit farther down the road, he had to get me, and that was that. So I understand that now, and I'm very grateful for that, there's no doubt. But as all that's going on, New Zealand flies a special agent down to New Zealand for the court trial. And they tell me I'm gonna have to pay $10,000 when I lose just for him to fly down there and all these court costs and everything. I'm like, uh, on top of this, it's just spinning out of control. So um, I really, really wasn't prepared for anything like that, except I had a little ace up my sleeve. When I was 30 years old here in South Bend, Indiana, I had a job fending for my kids, working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. They didn't have a union in the shop. And anyway, the higher ups thought I was the guy organizing the union. So the next thing you know, this goes to federal court. 
So I learned a lot then. I actually won that case only because I was just trying to get unemployment at the time and it ended up going to the federal court system. And I learned at that time how crooked and conniving all these lawyers are. They put three lawyers in there to win against that. I mean, I, I won this and I did learn greatly from that that prepared me for this next trial. So uh, that, that was another heaven sent that I looked at. But anyway, now uh, my wife at the time uh, takes off on me and goes back to the United States. She was a huge help. I mean, she could do a paralegal job, write letters for lawyers, match them left and right, because the government's down there. They try to soak all your money. They try to ruin your business. Uh, they just are very, very nasty. But anyway, she takes off. Uh, I'm abandoned in a foreign country. Ain't got no advocates, got nobody. Uh, I get out of jail uh, because they couldn't hold me for all the lies that he had told them. They checked it out and says, hey, that, that isn't true. So, you know, I am uh, was considered a very strong guy physically and mentally. I was used to knocking my own way down all through life. Everything came pretty easy for me. Uh, the only thing was, you know, I was putting all these dreams and desires first. I wasn't putting God first. And I would teeter and totter with God. You know, I, I had a relationship somewhat, but... He knew my whole heart wasn't in. There, there was no way, and he was going to show me here something. So anyway, I couldn't take any more. I mean, I was facing all this stuff, and there was a mountain that I couldn't budge, and I was never used to that. And so I finally had enough, and God knew this day that in my heart, I, didn't, I wasn't playing any games, and I meant everything that was going on. So I climbed up this big, tall mountain, and uh, I, I don't know, just took off, and I'm going up there. So... I actually fell down on my knees, and I give it all to God up there on that mountainside. I mean, tears run down my face. I, I was pouring it out. Walking up that hillside to that top, I had the weight of the world on my shoulders. When you're facing 52 years in prison and 2 million in fines and everything is unraveling in your life uh, that you've worked so hard for, I mean, it, it's, it's a nightmare. So I did. I, I poured it all out, and I told God, whatever you want. I said, you know, if you want... Me to go to jail, there's a reason for it. If you want my marriage gone, there's a reason for it. I says, hey, I'm giving it all to you. And I meant it, and he knew that. And so I turned around, walked down that hill eventually, and I went up there with all the weight of the world on my shoulders. And when I come down that hill, I had nothing but peace. It was the craziest thing. I mean, I'd reconnected with God, and he knew it, and it was going to be a great relationship from then on. And it has been for me. So that actually was the greatest thing in my life that I did there. And, you know, that, there's a moral on that for me was... You know, God doesn't need any help, and, and he got me to where I wanted to. And two governments like that uh, definitely are going to be nothing for him, but I couldn't budge him. So basically, the minute I come down that hillside, here's a manila envelope basically in my mailbox. From the court trial, they flew the special agent down. I had the court transcripts from that. Now I got this manila envelope that I've been trying so hard to get government uh, departments to give me these emails, what he had told them. One guy basically gave me those emails. So I took those and put them together. The special agent had perjured himself over six times and committed other things. So there's a miracle from God. And then I won't get into all the miracles that he did for me, but he just pushed those walls down that I couldn't budge just like instantly. And it was opening up paths for me to get back, get my freedom and all kinds of other things. So basically the moral of the story for me is it's a story of hope i mean when you're pushed up against that wall which a lot of you may be out here today uh hey there is hope you just got to go call upon the good lord and hey uh, miracles can happen like they did in my life and mine was like a big rubber band you know some people you don't have to pull up too far and smack them they get it get their attention but he had to really pull that back because i must have been extra stubborn and let me have it and that's what he put me through to get me back to him because he loved me of course so Anyway, I did that, but anyway, another thing, too, was touching on the marriage. I mean, I got out of the jail stuff in a way, but the marriage also was a rough thing, you know? And if you don't both have Christ in your life, and that's a pretty strong rope if you got two of them together, but if you put the third rope, which is God in there, too, and intertwine that, that's like a three-braided rope. I mean, it's almost unbreakable, and to have a strong marriage nowadays, you got to have that. Otherwise, you're going to have nothing but troubles and headaches. That's definitely something that's going to happen. And I want to say one other thing. You know, you've you got to call upon the good Lord when you're backed up against that wall. Don't think you're changing your rope because he can change things overnight. I mean, there's nothing more greater, more powerful than him. And I want to say one other thing, too. It took me two years to write this book. It took me two years to even start to write this book because, you know, I had a lot of anger in me. I mean, going through all this stuff, which I'm not telling you all of it, it's definitely in that book. I had a lot of anger. I'm facing a lot of bureaucrats that knew what they were doing, didn't stop, tried to you may make a career out of themselves on me. So 
So I couldn't do that. But, you know, uh, being a Christian and, and having the Holy Spirit in me and everything, the forgiveness, I have forgiven everybody that was involved in that. And the peace inside me is just priceless. And, and that's for being a Christian. So uh, that right there uh, just did everything for me to get to that point. And, and of course, God, in your life, uh, there's nothing better. I mean, there's just nothing better. My life now is just so much better. I mean, people might have said, hey, this guy lived a pretty good life. And, you know, he's doing all these, these adventures and stuff like that. Hey, that, that was nice. But the end result was I was doing them for myself. And, you know, God wants to have a relationship with you. And definitely he wants to do that with you and, and do it, you know, together. And that's what God was getting me for in my life. I understand this. I look back and I see that. So life to me is so much better now where I'm at than it ever has been in my life. So I want to let you know that, that uh, with God, anything is just so great and so much better. And just ask him and he will definitely come into your life. So saying that, I want to say one other thing. And it, it just is on my mind. Uh, I went to a big church not too long ago, thousands of people, and uh, they had an author that came in there, and uh, definitely wrote a big book, I won't even touch on that, but, you know, he did his spiel, and in the end, he says, hey, I want to tell you guys this, that Jesus isn't the good news, the good news is that God loves you, and I was surprised at that moment that they didn't take one of those big, long hands and yank him right off the stage, because really the good news is, Jesus Christ is the good news, because without Jesus Christ, in your life, or as your personal Savior, you cannot get to heaven. So I just wanted to state that, that there's no doubt Jesus Christ is the good news, and God definitely does love you. So 